talk of champions, short sessions. Long story short. Welcome into this bonus edition of the podcast here. I'm your host, Zach Barry. Joining me to recap a lot of Ole Miss LSU, but also we're going to get into the uh, the minutia and the, the ins and outs and all of the details that I know nothing about. And that is the offensive line. So we brought in former Ole Miss Rebel Sugar Bowl champion, Ben Still. Ben, good evening. I appreciate the time. It's been a minute since we've done one of these, but how are we doing? Doing good, man. I uh, appreciate you extending an invite. Um, glad to be on and talk football. Look, I, I told you before we hit record, I've had so many people ask me the last couple of weeks, you know, what's wrong with the offensive line? Why is Quinshawn Judkins struggling? You know, why can they not get it going? You know, essentially led the nation in rushing last year outside of two service academies. Um, now it looks like they might have figured something out after the LSU game where Quinshawn Judkins runs for 177. Ulysses Bentley runs for 90. He had a couple explosive runs, but um, it, it was had to be, uh, at least for you as a former offensive lineman, it had to be a little frustrating after uh, a year where they dominated and ran all over people and they returned four starters and they bring some, some portal guys in that are experienced, you know, and, and everybody's like, what the hell's going on? But before we get into what they did at the LSU game, what, what was your kind of assessment in the first four weeks of the season um, when they were kind of sluggish a little bit? Man, I, I kind of just sat there confused. I didn't really know what to, what to think is, I mean, what was it? We returned with four out of the uh, five guys from last year. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Quinshawn, and you're kind of just sitting there scratching your head. Um, I watched the first, what, I guess four games on TV. This was my first game in person, the LSU game. So I was able to kind of notice a few things. Um, but, yeah, I don't know if, if teams were just loading the box on us and we weren't able, weren't able to um, – scheme them out of, you know, loading the box. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was just uh, – they seemed sluggish. They seemed uh, – just couldn't move people out of uh, the running lanes, I guess. Um, just was just was off. It felt good. This game finally felt like one of – an offensive performance from last year for the first time, thankfully. Yeah, I think there were a lot of factors. Um, you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier uh, looking at – uh, some cut-ups of the game. There, I saw something on Twitter where Quinshawn Judkins had some uh, some pretty good pass protection uh, reps against Harold Perkins. But just looking at the overall tape, and he looked to be 100%. I know Kiffin had alluded to him being a little, um, I wouldn't say rusty. He was just a little banged up. I think he got a little banged up against Tulane, and he wasn't yeah. the same against Georgia Tech. And I, I think he was 100%, and, I mean, you were there in person. I was watching it on TV. He looked like he was running with a purpose. He was very intentional with how he was running the football. He looked like he had a different gear. But, yeah, his health, and then, you know, Priest Corn, Trey Harris go down, Zachary Franklin wasn't playing early in the year. The offense right. was just, you know, they weren't at full speed. So, I think, like you said, people were just stacking the box and daring Jackson Dart to throw. And then, oh, what do you know? You get everybody – you know, locked and loaded for LSU and you go over 700 yards of offense. So maybe that was it. Um, I did want to ask you though, I saw that Cole Kublik, he does some, uh, some recaps of the SEC teams every week. He does a a thread on, on Twitter, kind of recapping each team's performance um, for the week. And um, the one for Ole Miss, I'll, I'll get to it here. Uh, He had a mention about, offensive line play in there and i wanted to talk to you he's he said quote more gap scheme to handle penetration take advantage of light box let quarterback yep. make quick throws so offensive line can hold up um fine yards after catch which Ole Miss has got some dudes that can do that trey harris did it dayton wade and jordan watkins i i don't think they're getting enough credit um with how well they have played this year um but yeah, so as far as like gap versus zone blocking, I know that can differ with the run in the past, but as far as from right. your experience, how do you think that possibly helped them kind of jumpstart the offense? Yeah, um, I mean, in my head, uh, zone blocking, I tie that to the run game. When I hear gap, 
like a gap scheme. I tie that to uh, to the to the passing game. You know, I think there's probably offensive linemen, offensive line coaches out there that gap means run blocking and zone means pass blocking. But in my experience, that's where I tie those two to. Um, in the run game, it, the biggest thing I saw, uh, maybe it was because we had all the, all, all of our receivers back, but and able to spread them out, but we were we were getting LSU uh, playing you know three four down linemen with you know Mike linebacker in the middle and the outside linebackers were having to spread out and cover you know tight ends and receivers in the slot. So you know as an offensive lineman, if you're sitting there calling a run play and you see a five person you know five man box, maybe a six man box, you know you should be licking your chops um, if you can't run. <laughs> If you can't run against a five-man box, then there's something totally, totally wrong. Um, but they were able to get that done, and uh, I think them able, them being able to spread LSU's defense out, obviously were was success successful throwing the ball. So LSU had to honor the pass. Um, you know, you get LSU in a situation where you you've got one linebacker in the box. You know, you should be able to run on that all day long. I was pleased with the offensive line and, and just as a whole. Um, I I think his jersey was a little dirty from from running, but Jackson Dart, for the most part, stayed upright. I think they might have had – could pull up the box score here. I only remember maybe one sack. Um, I'll pull up the box score here and double check here. I know they that, you know, Harold Perkins almost had one and then Dart flipped it out to Judkins to avoid it. Um, no, no, misspoke. They had zero sacks. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow. No, they, that's, that's huge. Yeah. They, they, uh, it seemed like they were better at, you know, passing off twists. Um, you know, maybe it was more of a gap scheme than like a man scheme. You know, when you, when you switch to a gap scheme type of pass pro, you go from being locked into a man and all of a sudden you're, you're just protecting a gap. So if you're a right guard and someone's in your B gap and that guy goes to the A gap, you know, he, he crosses your face and goes towards the center. You don't have to track him because, you know, your center is going to be right there. So kind of just – it's easier to pass twist off, again, because you're not locked into a, you know, a specific man. You're just there protecting a, protecting a gap. So um, mm -hmm. it just – it kind of simplifies things. It kind of relieves some pressure. Um you know, I don't know. It's just a, it's a kind of a simpler way to, uh, to really just kind of block pass pro, you know, with twists and blitzes and stuff, just because you're sitting there guarding a gap instead of a person. Is this, um, probably you, you mentioned like having the, the ability to hand off different guys and, you know, it's same thing. And like, you know, on defense and coverage, if, you know, playing zone or, you know, guys crossing your face or if you're playing man and you're having to, you know, hand off someone else, if they go in motion, um, there's, there's gotta be a level of trust that's built in there where, you know, you can yeah. count on the guy next to you with, with the portal. And, you know, they, they bring in Victor Kern and um, Quincy McGee via the portal to go along with the four returning starters. Do, do you think that that's could also be a factor in, you know, it's week five and, you know, yeah, they had all their weapons back, but, you know, it was a pretty big jump with how well they played. Do you think that that could be something where they're just they're starting to get that chemistry going? Sure. I mean, they're they could be finally starting to gel. Um, you know, I couldn't imagine having to kind of reinstall an offense every year to new portal guys. You know, you kind of lose the uh, hey, this lineman's been here three or four years. They, <laughs> He knows the offense. You know, you're you're having to kind of reteach um, an offense to guys coming in every year, and on the offensive line, that's a that's a big deal. Um, so, I hope if that's the case, I hope they're finally starting to gel, trust each other, kind of know how everyone plays, and you know, I hope that's the case. No, if that's the case, we got we got some good things ahead for sure. Yeah, it's it's. It's tough because, you know, 
you talking from experience, you, you always had that guy on the far left end of the line that, you know, <laughs> everybody kind of was like, yeah, he'll, he'll take care of it. Yeah, um, we could just, we could just slide away from Laramie and trust that he's got the, <laughs> trust that he's got the defensive end on his own. <laughs> um, I did want to ask you, you know, we, we joked about it during the game and it seems like we do it every week now, but I don't know. You're a lineman, so you, you can tell much better than I can. I never played the position. Um, I feel like at times there are some guys on the line that get picked on from the officials. I do think some of it is on their, is their fault. Um, I I've heard people that know line play, you know, former coaches, scouts that say Micah Pettis can sometimes get a little greedy and uh, you know, he'll try to go for the home run block. You know, he'll try to pancake a guy or throw him down and he'll get called for holds. Um, yep. do you think that that's the case or do you think that, you know, he might just be getting caught, getting beat a couple of times and getting a little grabby or is, is that something you ever had to deal with? You know, not just you, but just your, your teammates, you know, you know, man, cause I feel like Pettis is just, he doesn't have to do that, but it's just, you know, that's the stuff you want on film, right? You want to show people that you threw the dude to the ground or pancaked him. Is that a real thing? Or do you think that they might just be getting a little grabby? Uh, man, you, they're probably getting a little grabby most of the time, but I mean, you do get kind of carried away trying to pancake someone or throw someone to the ground and, you know, your hand slips out and all of a sudden you're holding the shoulder pad and there comes the yellow flag. So, uh, you know, probably a little mixture of both if I had to guess, but, uh, you know, if that, if that's what he's getting called, called holding on, you know, I'm not, I'm not against that. Just keep doing it. Are you looking at cutting your health insurance premiums by as much as 20 to 30%? Are you aging into Medicare and need help finding a Medicare supplement plan? Call Drew Moak of USA Benefits Group at 601-953-8449. Drew is an Ole Miss grad located in Mississippi and licensed in seven states. He works with the nation's second largest health insurance brokerage with access to 35 different carriers, and he can help you with any of your health insurance needs. From regular health plans to life insurance to dental and vision and even Medicare, he has it all covered. Now more than ever, it is critical to have a health insurance agent who is local and accessible. So call Drew Moak at 601 601- Nine five three eight four four nine, and get your free quote today. Cooler temperatures are right around the corner, and as I like to say, it's the perfect time to play a round of golf. And if you're looking for a premier golf course in Northwest Mississippi or the Memphis, Tennessee area, go to Cherokee Valley Golf Club in Olive Branch, 15 minutes from the Memphis International Airport. With those cooler temps, you might want to stay warm and comfortable on the course this fall. Go in the clubhouse and check out their new selection of outerwear from Travis Matthew and FootJoy, including FootJoy's new lightweight hoodie. This 18-hole par 72 course includes four sets of tees to accommodate all players and has 11 lakes, 52 bunkers, and the wide Zoysia fairways and extra-large champion Bermuda greens and clean roughs make for an excellent opportunity every single time to post a number. If you need a premier golf experience in the Mid-South, go to Cherokee Valley Golf Club. Call them at 662-893-4444 or check them out, olivebranchgolf.com. We've all been there before. A weekend trip to the casino canceled because real life came calling. Well, my bookie's new and improved online casino is here to change the game. Dive into a truly realistic casino experience featuring the latest in slots, progressive jackpots, and live dealer action all from the comfort of your own home. Take advantage of weekly blackjack tournaments and a brand new collection of high-end games for a chance at real cash rewards. The MyBookie Casino provides a Las Vegas experience when the action's in your hands. And the best part is you don't even need to wear pants. Your adventure at the MyBookie Casino begins today with a generous sign-up bonus using promo code TOC for Talk of Champions TOC. That's promo code TOC to secure yourself a sweet deposit bonus. And that's not all, because their revamped loyalty program ensures that you'll be showered with rewards, including free spins, cashback offers, and a host of exclusive VIP perks. The more you play, the more you win. Play anytime, anywhere with the MyBookie Casino. And make sure to check out MyBookie for all your gaming needs at www.mybookie.ag. That's www.mybookie.ag.
This podcast also comes to you thanks to Bluff City Advisory Group, Memphis's leading team of finance professionals who can provide advanced assistance with financial planning, pension, and qualified plan support, and business and estate planning strategies as well. Former Ole Miss Rebel and founding partner Ben Still, along with his elite level customer service team, make it their goal to help you meet the ongoing demands of your financial needs. Learn about this and more at BluffCityAdvisory.com. I'd much rather have some offensive linemen that are overly aggressive and maybe <clears throat> too mean than uh, the opposite. Um, right. Yeah, you, you got to have a little mean streak in you. Um, Caleb Warren um, played your position um, or yep. is playing your position this year. He was on the uh, Pro Football Focus Team of the Week. He had himself a day in the trenches going up against the likes of Mason Smith and Mikhail Wingo and that that front seven of, of LSU. Um, I know that he's not one of the more heralded names on that offensive line, but uh, you know, what have you seen from him at the center position so far this year? Um, I thought the interior line did, did fantastic holding the pocket. Uh, um, like I said, they did a great job passing off twists and even, you know, I know, you know, people were talking about this, this gap scheme, but you know, there was a handful of times I saw him have to, he raised his hand up and make a five call, which means, hey, we're five on five, every man for himself. And uh, they all they all held up. And it even gets harder when everyone's man on man, you know, five on five and people are twisting and stuff. It's hard to it's hard to pass twist off and pick up blitzes when you're when you're having to do that. And they were uh, they were doing it. It would seem fine. So, um, you know, I, that's a testament to that center position, communicating, making sure everyone's on the same page. Because last thing, last thing you want to do, you know, I don't know if it's like this, but you usually don't go to the line. Like you usually don't break the huddle, go to the line, expect you know, with a five call in hand. That's usually an audible the center makes on the line of scrimmage. So um, the fact that he was able to kind of switch up protections and. Um, get that communicated to everyone on the line uh, and execute it at the same time while going fast, you know, that, that speaks volumes to, to him as a center and to, you know, the line, maybe like you said earlier, maybe they're finally gelling and able to communicate and play together faster. So um, I thought it was all, I, I liked, I liked what I saw. Yeah. I, when people would ask me and, you know, I was like, I don't know. But the first thing I would say was, you know, well, John Garrison didn't just all of a sudden forget how to coach offensive line. Right. Um, I mean, he's he's been around the block forever. He coached a ton of NFL dudes at Nebraska. Um, and it, I don't think that's the issue. Um, I, I mean, he I can, I can never remember his name. Um, you know, his basically his, you know, pride and joy of, of guys that he's coached. Um, over the years uh, at NC State, um, Ika McWanu went sixth overall to the Panthers in 2022. Um, you know, that guy was, you know, probably a three star, like, you know, just kind of a middle of the road guy that he found and just built into this monster first round talent. Um, so, yeah, that was my thing. It was like, I, you know, they got four guys that came back. They, they're, you know, returning starters. It's not like they're all new. I know they have the portal guys, but they're experienced. So, yeah, yeah I think there's several factors there. You know, health, you know, some continuity in there. And then, um, you know, Judkins now running the ball is going to open things up. Uh, I, I, I did want to mention this before I forget. You mentioned spacing out LSU. Um, that, that was something that I noticed a little bit more on Saturday as opposed to the first four weeks where – I thought they were getting more out into, you know, those wide, wide receiver splits, you know, like the traditional Baylor <coughs> where you're getting guys out at the numbers or past the numbers to really right. spread things out. Um, yeah. I think that that helped open things up with, you know, the deep over routes, the crossing routes. And then, of course, with Priest Corn being healthy, he was a huge factor in getting open in the middle of the field. So, um, yeah, I think that's only going to help the offense and then, Jackson Dart can take off and run when he needs to, as he did on Saturday. But um, as far as the rest of the schedule, 
as a uh, as an offensive lineman, um, you have to think outside of you know, statistically they're not up there. Like looking at like sack numbers in the in the conference, A and M is second in the conference with twenty. Ole Miss is quietly third in the SEC in sacks, but outside of A and M, I mean Auburn's down there at nine, Georgia's at thirteen. You have to think the biggest test for this offensive line is going to be A and M in November, right? That would make sense. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know what our, I don't know what the stats are for Arkansas. I mean, I'm not really worried about Vandy. I'm sitting here looking at the schedule. Um, Arkansas game's always weird. Um, yeah, I'm yeah, sure they're, Georgia, they're fifth Georgia, in the conference, so they're kind of middle of the road. Middle, uh, yeah. I'm sure Georgia has some has some players, so um, yeah. I don't know. A&M before Georgia, hopefully a good test. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. In the SEC, most most front sevens are – have some players and are and are good. So you, there's not really there's usually not a not a team you can you can sleep on. Um but yeah, I guess, you know, looking towards that AM game, we'll we'll see how they do against those guys. It's funny listening to talking heads on Sunday and today raving about AM's defensive line and how good they were <laughs> against Arkansas. It's like, well, what do you think was going to happen when they signed, you know, 19 five-star defensive linemen? They were going to figure it out at some point. Um, yeah, at some point you got to, right? Yeah, yeah. They can't all they can't all bust, but yeah, they uh yeah, Durkin's got a good good group over there. That's going to be a stern test in November. Um yeah, I, and yeah, Georgia's going to have guys. It, that's a weird stat. Like they're second to last in the conference in sacks. Um which I don't think they got their first sack until maybe week three. Really? Um, yeah, which was bizarre. Um, I mean, hell, the the bottom four teams in sacks right now are LSU, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, who typically have good front seven players year yeah. in year out. So that's that's a little that's a little weird. But um, as far as the you know just the overall outlook for the rest of this season we're coming up on the halfway point this weekend against Arkansas in week six um you mentioned that game's always weird I, the line is it has moved since it opened I think it opened at what nine nine and a half um yeah what's what's it at now 11 or am I, making I think it's up? at 11 or 11 and a half in some books um I'm still not sure what to think about this game I know that they fought hard against A&M but they ended up just they they, they couldn't they couldn't handle the pressure up front and KJ Jefferson's kind of having to do it by himself. You know, they lose their, their true freshman tight end. That was having a hell of a year. Lucas breaks his clavicle. He's out for the year. And then rocket Sanders is now just getting back. He, he I think he had like 33 yards in that game. So he's not a hundred percent yet. Um, you know, how do you see this game going? Cause I, I, I like Sam Pittman. I, I think he, I, I, as someone that's just like a, just a person, like if I saw him at a hotel bar, that's probably a dude I want to go have a beer or two with. Um, <laughs> and I don't think he's a bad coach. I just think this was a, this was a very big transition year for that program. Both coordinators are new and they lost a lot on both sides, but you know, just a 5,000 foot view of this game as we record this Monday evening, what do you think about Saturday's game against Arkansas? Um, well, I, Saturday instilled some confidence back in me that I had lost after the uh, the Bama game. So yeah. uh, I'm feeling a little bit better where we are now going into this game. But I feel like this is one of those games you can throw out what the spread is and stuff. I mean, it's it's always going to be close um, for the most part. Uh, KJ Jefferson's a good quarterback. Um, I'm sure Arkansas is going to have a good offensive line. I'm sure they're going to have a decent front seven. You know, this is – I wouldn't – I wouldn't just obviously hope and want us to win. I wouldn't – I'm not someone going to sit there and say, oh, this is a guarantee, guaranteed game by any stretch of the imagination. So, I'm hoping that uh, we we'll come out hot again. Um, we keep, keep blocking well, keep running the ball well, keep throwing the ball well because 
if you're doing all that stuff, it just opens up, opens up everything for you. So we'll see. Yep. Ole Miss looking to get to the bye week after this, get healthy and ready for that uh, road trip to Auburn in a couple weeks. That's uh for me, that's the one that I think is circled, not only because <laughs> of the obvious reasons, but it seems like you get past Arkansas and it, the games at home. I think Ben, that, that gives me a lot more confidence in picking Ole Miss. If it was on the road, I would be a little skittish. <laughs> right. Um, the home team typically wins this game. Uh, I know it's it's been kind of weird in the last decade. There's been some some crazy games and some some games that didn't make any sense, but home team definitely holds the edge. So I like Ole Miss on Saturday. But yeah, at Auburn is is kind of the roadblock here. Ole Miss doesn't win there a lot, and um, Auburn is certainly gettable. Their offense is not good. <laughs> Um, yep. de- defense is solid, but they, they just don't have anything on offense right now. Yeah, it seems like they're kind of – feels like they have everything but a quarterback right now. So, um, let, let Freeze get a quarterback in there. They could uh, could get dangerous. I'm glad, I'm glad uh, Spencer Sanders decided to come sit the bench <laughs> with us instead <laughs> of <laughs> – Yeah, that would – um. That would be interesting. The one, the one that that we've talked about on our show um, in the last couple of weeks is uh, AJ Swan at Vandy. Yeah. Um, I know he's hurt now, but a lot of people were saying that you know he he's he's too good for Vandy. Like he he might go shop around next uh next off season. Uh, I don't know if he really fits what Freeze likes to do, but he's certainly better than what he has right now. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean you've got at Auburn in a couple of weeks, and then you've got the tune up before a And M against Vandy, and um, then you got the big one, November 11th. I know, like the M Club and stuff, they've got a lot of stuff planned for that weekend. They've got their big annual Hall of Fame dinner that Thursday night. Um, got a bunch of players coming to town that Friday night at the Lyric. I mean, there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of players, ex-players, um, coming in town for that game. So I think if we keep winning, that's going to be a be an energy filled filled weekend in Oxford. <clears throat> yeah, they might uh, they might challenge to break that attendance record they set on Saturday because you beat Arkansas, Auburn, and Vandy. You're looking at seven and one hosting A and M. Who Ole Miss fans look. It, I'm not saying you got to do a, a midnight yell in your backyard, but you need to be pulling for A&M this weekend if you want a chance at the West. They host Alabama. Um, if they beat Bama, it really makes things interesting in the West because Ole Miss obviously needs Bama to lose two. Um, yep. And they got to lose this weekend if you want to get a shot at getting to Atlanta that one last time while divisions are a thing before uh, Oklahoma and Texas join the conference next year. So, um yeah, it that November fourth weekend is is shaping up to be. We might have a repeat of uh, in twenty twenty one when uh, game day was in town for that one. So That'd be a big that, that would be a big one. Yeah. All right, that will do it for this bonus flagship. Ben, I appreciate the time, man. This has been fun. Yeah, uh, we'll uh, we'll do it again soon, and um. Until next time, my friend. Until next time. All righty, that's going to do it. Make sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to the Talk of Champions Podcast Network. We will have shows all this week leading up to Arkansas. Always check out the site, omspirit.com, for everything you need. And be sure to check out our YouTube channel where we put all of our podcasts there as well. That's at omspirit on YouTube. Subscribe there smash the like button, all that good stuff. Leave some comments and um, we'll get you ready for Arkansas Saturday night, 630 SEC Network. So for Ben over there, I'm Zach. Until next time, we out.